Hello and welcome to Back to the Movies. I'm your host, Giovanna Sakevich. And I'm Steve Harmon. Hopefully all of you went out to vote last week for the election. With such a close race, every vote really counted. We now will have four more years with our current president and we'll just have to see what the future holds. Who did you vote for, Steve? I don't vote until. Okay, fine. We'll leave it as a mystery for the both of us. Although, if we did vote for different candidates, it would be a good starting ground for a debate. Why do we need to have a debate? Well, it helps us to get into the political spirit, of course. If we're going to do a debate, we should have done this last week. What's wrong with a little post-election wrap-up? Besides the fact that I'm sick of the political ads and political speeches? Yes! Do you have a valid argument for not having a post-election debate? Well, I... <laughs> Wait, are you trying to trick me into debating about having a debate? No. You are, aren't you? Listen, the last thing I really want to do is be involved in a political debate, okay? I, I want to talk about movies. That's what the show's about, right? Okay, maybe we could debate movie topics then? I guess that's a little more tolerable, uh, but why debate at all? Because it would be something different and movies are a fun topic. Okay, let's just see where this takes us. Deal? Deal. Now, why don't you start with a new release for this week? Okay, just to warn you all, this week is another slow week in Hollywood. Our one new release for this week is Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2. Basically, so after two of the most annoying vampires of all time have a baby, the Cullens gather other vampire clans together along with their mortal enemies, the Wolf Pack. Basically, they group together to protect the child from the murderous Dakota Fanning and her Italian vampire mafia. But I did hear that Kristen, I can't act Stewart, told Jay Leno there is a plot change that offers a twist ending. And that's about all I want to say about the Twilight movie. I think the reason that there is only one new release this week is because no one wants to compete with a big blockbuster like Twilight. I just don't understand the big appeal of these movies. Sparkly vampires, werewolves who seem to always conveniently lose a shirt, a girl who can't act, of course, and it sounds like just another teeny bopper movie. I mean, at least the Harry Potter plot changed for each movie. Twilight has a big appeal to all ages. There's elements of fantasy, romance, and danger in every movie. These can appeal to all ages. I think the elements of danger could be contested and the few thriller scenes, if they could even be categorized as such, usually don't happen until the very end of the movie. It's all hearts and flowers until then. The last film features a big battle with lots of action. It's the climax of the series. <laughs> you just admitted that it always happens at the end. I guess I lost this round. Let's move on to the Parkwood 17 review. Okay, what movie did you review this week? Well, I liked our coverage of Wreck-It Ralph so much that I decided to see if it would be as good as we thought it would be. So was it? Oh yeah, it was fantastic. Disney always delivers. Yeah, I was really looking forward to this movie because I like video games and all that. Uh, what was the basic plot or whatever of it? Well, it's about this guy named Ralph and he's part of this game called Fix It Felix. And he is the bad guy in the game. His job is to wreck these windows and then Felix goes and fixes them. And I guess Ralph decided that he was sick of being the bad guy, but in order to be considered to be a good guy in his game, he had to earn a medal. So he travels through the cords, that's how the characters get to different games and earns a medal and in the process helps a little girl win a race. Oh well, so does he go to different games or you, you said, I mean, any ideas of what other games like ones we like from when we were kids? Well, I don't think any of the games are recognizable. They're mostly just Disney games, but they did feature Pac-Man and some other well-known characters. But the games that Rolf travels to include Sugar Rush. It's kind of like Candyland. It has a little track, and all these little characters have a race, and that was the main focus of the film. I really like the idea of like the bad guy wanting to be good because it kind of reminds me of like Mega Mind, where you know the bad guy wants to be good and you know he does everything he can to try to you know change his ways, and you know that's always a good positive. Uh, thing for people. Definitely. It's a lot of great characters, a lot of great voice actors and actresses. They have a great cast and a lot of funny dialogue, a lot of funny moments. I know we have John C. Riley in it and Sarah Silverman. Anybody else that's a big? I don't think anyone of note, um, but Sarah Silverman, she was great in it. She really was. It was amazing that they actually picked her because she's normally as a raunchy person, but uh, to put her in a cartoon is kind of interesting. Right. I can't well, wait to see how that turns out. Oh, yeah, she was fantastic. Well, we'd like to once again thank Parkwood 17 for allowing us to review this film. Uh, students, remember to get your discount tickets at the information booth in Atwood. I was walking through Atwood earlier this week and I happened to notice that this week's Atwood Movie Night is showing the perfect film for our show this week. Are you going to tell me what it is? Nope, I'm going to let you keep wondering until Nathan gives us the details. What's playing this week, Nathan? Hey, Nathan here for another version of Atwood Movie Night. Well, this week the Atwood Theatre is showing The Campaign. Now The Campaign stars Will Ferrell and Zach Galvanakis. 
Now, Will Ferrell does run unattended in the movie until Sakhil Vanakis comes in the last minute to run against him. Now, if you have not seen this movie, it's a pretty wacky movie, and it's pretty hard to choose between two candidates. That's what I'm gonna do this week. I'm gonna ask a few students to see who will they vote for. If Will Ferrell or Sack Gilvanakis ran for president, who would you vote for? Will Ferrell, for sure. All right, good choice. Hello there. Who would you vote for, Will Ferrell or Sack Gilvanakis? Yeah, who would you vote for? Will Ferrell or Sack Gilvanakis? You're not sure. All right. Hi there. Hey, I have a really quick question to ask you. Who would you vote for, Will Ferrell or Sack Gilvanakis? For president. Yeah. <laughs> Will Ferrell or Sack Gilvanakis ran for president, who would you vote for? Sack Gilvanakis. All right, good choice. How about you? Will Ferrell. Oh, uh, you two are split then. Uh, politics. It's crazy. Hey there, man. Got a question to ask you. Who would you vote for president, Will Ferrell or Sack Gilvanakis? Zach All right. Hey there, I got a question to ask you. Who would you vote for president, Will Ferrell or Zach Gilvanakis? Will Ferrell. All right. Who would you vote for president, Will Ferrell or Zach Gilvanakis? Who's the second person? Uh, Zach Gilvanakis, you know the guy with Carlos in The Hangover? I don't know him. Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell? <laughs> okay. Hey, you got a question to ask you. If Will Ferrell or Zach Gilvanakis ran for president, who would you vote for? Who would you vote for president if these, if these two people ran? Will Ferrell or Zach Gilvanakis? Uh, I don't know who the second one is. He's uh, Carlos, you know, in The Hangover, the crazy guy with the glasses. Yeah, I haven't seen the movie yet. Will Ferrell, I think. Neither. Neither. Hi. He has no clue. Hi there. I got a question to ask you too. If Will Ferrell or Zach Gilvanakis ran for president, who would you vote for? Uh, Will Ferrell. That's the only person I know. All right, Will Ferrell. And Will you. Ferrell. All right, two Will Ferrells. <laughs> well, it looks like good old Mr. Sack should try to find a better campaign manager. It's pretty obvious that Will Ferrell would win. Well, I'm Nathan Fuller, and this has been another version of Adlib Movie Night. Thanks, Nathan. So it is the campaign, huh? Well, who would have thought that would be the choice after the election? Will Ferrell and Zach Galifianakis seem to be good competitors. Maybe they should actually run for office one year. We're not going to have another Jesse Ventura or Arnold Schwarzenegger. Reagan was a good actor, and he did a good job of running the country. You're doing it again. I'm not going to debate politics with you. <sighs> Fine. Let's just take a break. I'll have to try again next block. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Back to the Movies. Giovanna, I hope you've finally given up trying to get me to debate about politics. I already said I would talk about movies. Isn't that good enough? I guess it'll have to be for now. Okay. Well, we already debated about why Twilight should or should not be popular, so what do you want to debate about now? Let's see if Hollywood gossip gives us something good to talk about. Colette, what is the latest gossip this week? Hello everyone, my name is Colette Locke and welcome to Hollywood Gossip. With all the political debates over, I'm aware there are a few of you out there going through withdrawal from all the drama, but have no fear. This week, I dug into the past to share with you some of the most famous and nasty celebrity feuds in Hollywood. Let's start off with a story I think Giovanna will appreciate. Back in 2008, Selena Gomez and Demi Lovato got into some drama when a fellow real-life Disney princess, Miley Cyrus, made a YouTube video making fun of Gomez and Lovato. In the video, the last song actress and a friend had dressed up as the duo and mocked their makeup, style, and even went as low as making fun of Demi's gapped teeth. The feud seemed to have exploded out of nowhere, and the Hotel Transylvania actress, Gomez, has fought back, claiming she barely knew Miley and Demi had never met her before. The three eventually made up and became friends, or so according to Miley, who in an interview claimed awkwardly, quote, I actually am going to have meatloaf with Demi tonight. I'm riding my bike to Demi's house, so I'm going to be partying with Demi, and because we're friends, I love her and she's always there for me. She's one of my bestest friends. Okay, Miley. Shh. It's okay. 
We all know Tom Cruise has not been shy to the tabloid world recently, nor was he back in 2005 after he apparently lost his marbles on the couch on the Oprah Winfrey show. Cruise unexpectedly lashed out at the Blue Lagoon actress Brooke Shields, claiming she should not have taken antidepressants to combat the postpartum depression she was suffering from after the birth of her first child. Cruise felt it was for some reason his business to get involved, insisting depression could be fought with vitamins and exercise. The Scientology way. Shields fought back against the actor, taking a stand for women everywhere, claiming quote, comments like those made by Tom Cruise are a disservice to mothers everywhere. Probably fearing riots of women at his front door, Cruise immediately apologized to Shields publicly and to her face. Way to go, girl! Moving on to our next feud between another set of young Disney actresses fighting over a boy. Back in 2002, Lindsay Lohan found herself in a beef with Hilary Duff after Lohan apparently stole Duff's sweetie, Aaron Carter. Carter had left the Cinderella Story actress to hook up with the mean girl and then dumped Lohan to go back to Duff. Instead of the sensible thing and getting mad at the singer, the girls turned on each other in a feud that lasted for several years. Ultimately, the young actresses decided to grow up and let let things go, claiming, quote, we are both adults and whatever happened, happened when we were young. It's over. Well, looking through all these past feuds, it would be obvious to end this with the cliche, save the drama for your mama, but honestly, it has got me kind of wanting to get in on the action, so. Hey Steve, nice shirt. Hashtag, back to the movies, hashtag, what not to wear. Thanks for gossiping with me. Join me again next week for all the juicy details in Hollywood. Celebrity feuds are always interesting. Says you. It, it just sounds like petty high school drama, though, all over again. Why? Just because they're famous, that means that they can't have disagreements with each other? No, they can have arguments. Celebrities are human, too, but mature adults don't duke it out in public. Well, it can give an actor some free publicity. Isn't there a saying about how any publicity is good? Yes, there is, but I still say it is annoying to listen to people argue over he said, she said kind of stuff. Like I said, high school type drama. Okay, I think we're going to be at a stalemate with this one. Let's move on to the extra. This week, Nick will be comparing two movies, but they are pretty much the same movie. Nick, what is your opinion of the two Rollerball films? Hello and welcome to the extra. My name is Nick Doff. This week I'm going to talk to you about a movie remake that was a great movie during the 1970s. They decided to make a real poor remake of it in the 2000s. That movie was Rollerball. The original film was made in 1975 with the setting having the film take place during 2018. For those of you that are wondering, Rollerball is similar to Roller Derby, but more violent. In Rollerball, participants are suited up with armor where contact is encouraged. The main goal is for the teams to score a goal with a softball sized steel ball. The one catch? is that the person who has the ball must have the ball present at all times. This version stars James Kahn as Jonathan E., who is the star player on his team. John Hoseman stars as Bartholomew, the man who is the chairman of the Energy Corporation, which happens to sponsor the team that Jonathan is a part of. The film also stars Maude Adams as Ella, Jonathan's ex-wife, and their marriage had ended when Ella became an executive. The main plot throughout the film is to find a way to make Jonathan retire, which he refuses to do. Jonathan's team makes it to the championship game, where there is a stipulation added. In the championship game, the rules are for the game to be played without substitutions and no time limit. In a way, the corporation wants there to be absolutely no way that Jonathan can win. It then becomes the gla a, gla a gladiatorial last man standing event, where there can only be one winner. It comes down to Jonathan and a guy on the other team. Jonathan then grabs a hold of the ball and ends up scoring the only goal of the game. The final scene involves Jonathan skating around the track with spectators chanting Jonathan's name repeatedly. The overall reception of this film was good. TV Guide had gave it a 3 out of 4 stars rating, saying that the performance by Khan was excellent and the rollerball sequences are fast paced and interesting. Time Magazine's Jay Cox posted a negative review of the film. Cox had stated that Khan looked very unconvincing and uncomfortable as Jonathan. Now to the remake that according to Metacritic.com was one of the worst movie remakes of all time. This installment of rollerball takes place in modern time unlike the previous one where it takes place in the distant future. It starts off when an NHL hopeful Jonathan Cross, played by Chris Klein, is recruited by Marcus Ridley, played by LL Cool J, to join him on a team in Kazakhstan. The team is joined by a female teammate named Aurora, also known as the Black Widow, played by Rebecca Romaine. By this time, rollerball has increased popularity worldwide, with teams even in Central Asia. The promoter Alexei Petrovich, played by Jean Reno, and his assistant Sanjay, played by Naveen Andrews, become intrigued by the popularity of the sport and they want the game to become as gory as possible. The overall reception of this film was terrible. Chris Klein, the main character in the film, was referred to as a bland hero. 
Time Out's Trevor Johnson had stated that the film was perfect for 15 year olds. The reason for that being there was heavy metal music being played throughout the film, including the frequent sightings of motorbikes and skateboards. Rotten Tomatoes had ranked the film 28th in the worst reviewed films of the 2000s with a terrible approval rating of 3%. With all the negatives that came with the film, there was one positive. Rebecca Romaine was nominated for a Razzie in the category of Worst Supporting Actress. Thanks for watching The Extra. I'm Nick Doroff. Enjoy the rest of the show. It seems like the remake of Rollerball was not really accepted by the public. I'm not really sure I like remakes. They seem to try way too hard to make the original movies more modern. Hold on, are you saying there's some genres of movies you don't like? Well, kind of, if you count remakes a genre. Steve, I would think you would dislike them as much as I do. Not necessarily. There are hit and miss for me, though. I'm curious about the Red Dawn remake that will be coming out soon, and that movie's a remake. I guess it's time to take another break. We can continue debating remakes versus originals during the commercials. Finally, something I want to debate. We'll be right back. Welcome, you're watching Back to the Movies. The next segment of our show features the exact topic that I already said I didn't want to talk about, politics. You are not talking about politics. Derek will be the one talking about it. Yes, but we still have to talk about it after. Hopefully we can talk about other aspects of the movie besides the political aspect. Derek, what was this week's bad movie all about? America has spoken and Mitt Romney, you have lost. Hello and welcome to Bad Movies. Today's movie is 2016 Obama's America, otherwise known as my personal least favorite movie of all time. Seriously, I hate it more than Howard the Duck. I would say the Star Wars prequels, but some people like me like them. But seriously, I haven't even seen this movie and I know it's terrible because of its huge presence in the media this year. Apparently, it's all about how Obama is like a sleeper agent bent on revenge and is going to carry out some kind of secret Muslim Arab Brotherhood mission in term two. Uh, I think the word here is fear mongering. I think the reviews speak for themselves. One critic called this movie GOP Convention Confetti. The only positive review I could find called the director the conservative Michael Moore. Cause the world really needed that. One crazy political loudmouth is good enough for me. I do not need another. Thanks to Rotten Tomatoes, we can put a grade on this movie. So let's think now. Most of us watching this are college students. If you got a 27% in your class, would you pass? This movie is a failure and Rotten Tomatoes proves that. But seriously, if I wanted to watch an hour of fear mongering, I would just turn on the local news. They're always saying there's some new drug out there that kids are magically using. I could be scared all day, but I don't need to watch this movie and pay $10 to see really ridiculous factual information. On a final note, I have to say goodbye to Mitt Romney. It's been really good. It's been really good laughing at you every week. But to be honest, the saddest thing about this election being over is that we had a really cool segment planned if Mitt Romney would have won where I was going to be in the corner of the room crying with a bucket of ice cream. So I kind of miss the idea of the ice cream, but not him. Romney's 10 times better than Obama. What is this guy doing in my apartment? Who are you? The door was locked. How did you get in here? Never mind, you socialist. Obama's 2016 is a great movie. Call me a socialist, will you? He knows what to do, don't you? Ah! ah! Oh, <laughs> that was bad movies for this week. Don't mess with me, and don't mess with my president. Goodbye. So how can we discuss this film without talking about politics? The whole movie was politics. We could talk about what made it a good documentary. We didn't actually see the film though. We can't review it. Derek already did that. Maybe this is one segment we don't need to debate over. We could postpone our debate until after the next segment. I agree. International films usually can give us something to talk about. This week, Alan will cover both versions of the film, State of Play. Alan, what are these two films about? 
Hello everyone, welcome back to International Film. As we all know, there are many films from overseas that caught the attention of our Hollywood producers and then being adapted or remade into its American version. Some of them did a great job, while some of them left quite a controversy behind for us to judge. The one I'm going to introduce to you guys today is exactly one of them. It's the 2009 film State of Play, which was adapted from the six-part British television serial of the same name, which first aired on BBC One in 2003. The plot of the six-hour serial was condensed to fit a two-hour movie format, with the location changed to Washington, D.C. The serial was set in London, in which a politician's life becomes increasingly complex as his research assistant is found dead on the London underground, and in a seemingly unrelated incident, a teenage pickpocket is shot dead. However, in the movie, a petty thief is gone down in the alley and a congressman's assistants fall in front of a subway to a seemingly unrelated death, but not to the wisecracking brash newspaper reporter Cal McFree, who spies a conspiracy waiting to be uncovered. With a turbulent past connected to the congressman and the aid of ambitious young rookie writer Della Fry, Cal begins uprooting clues that lead him to a cooperate cover-up full of insiders, informants, and assassins. Both of them had a very strong cast. In the American version, Ben Affleck was featured as the uprising congressman Stephen Collins, the Academy-winning actor Russell Crowe cast as the journalist Cal. On the contrast, in the British version, they featured the veteran actor Bill Nye, uprising actor at that time James McRoy, Kelly MacDonald, and John Sim. Newspaper The Guardian wrote that, it's bloody magic. The story is gripping, the acting is icy, and the script is outstanding. The dialogue is exceptional, the exposition is swift, nifty, and joyless and clunky. The characters are credible and rounded. Personally, I have to agree with The Guardian. The performance from the BBC version was just phenomenal. As a political thriller, sometimes it's, it's a little bit hard to put audience really into the set and successfully convey the emotions to them. But through the very sturdy performance from the cast like Bill Nye, who won the British Act Academy Television Award for Best Actor of his role in it, as well as the proper pace and progress controlled by the director, the whole watching experience was fully and delightfully. As for the film, I feel like they kind of waste such a strong cast, but probably it was because they tried to fit this complicated storyline into just a two hour long movie. Well, there were some sacrifices they have to make. Anyway, both of them are good, and the well designed storyline guaranteed it won't be a horrible choice to watch them, no matter from the BBC version or the Hollywood one. Alright, this is this week's international film, and Alan, thanks for watching. See you next time. So it was a conspiracy type movie. <laughs> I knew it. Another political movie. Looks like you were wrong on this one, Giovanna. Well, let's talk about another foreign film that was remade in Hollywood. What, like The Ring or The Grudge? Please, those remakes were terrible. I'll admit, the American version of The Grudge was kind of cheesy. The original was Japanese and the remake was American, but the American film took place in a Japanese style house. Wouldn't it have been less cheesy if they tried to adapt it a little more, besides just the characters, I mean? I think we can also agree that it is time to take our last break of the evening. Yep, we'll see you after this. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. As we near the end of our show this week, we have one last segment, our parody of the week. Ironically, we will be spoofing a film we already talked about this week, The Campaign. I think this will be really interesting. Nick, how did you and the crew do? I don't like you and you don't like me, but only one of us can be student body president. You know what? You like the leprechaun. Let's bring it. You're going down for that. Oh, hi. I'm Nathan Fuller. If you're like me, education is very important for the student body. That's why my policy of having every single student read a book and carrying all of our computer devices go on the back of good old-fashioned paper. Hi, I'm Ed Barron. I'm running for student body president. Vote for me, I'll bring smoking back to campus. We'll have smoke all over. Vote Ed Barron. Nice to meet you. Vote for me. Hey. Thanks for helping us out. Hey. Oh. Nice game boy. I love game boy. <laughs> Hello there. Nice to, nice to meet you. I'm running for student body president. Hi. Okay. Going to school. Stay smart kids, okay? Okay. Stay in school. Thank you. <laughs> 
Ladies and gentlemen, my candidate is the one type of person I absolutely hate in the world, leprechauns. They are worthless, mythical creatures that just live under a trees in Ireland and care about pots of gold. They make horrible cereal like Lucky Charms that is just corn and marshmallows and sugar. It's awful, it's disrespectful, and gives me a horrible school president. Where does this guy get off calling me a leprechaun? He's after my Lucky Charms. I will be better for the student body president, and I am not a leprechaun. Looks like a good race. According to my phone, looks like I have the most smoke, so therefore I win. Because all you know, smoking ban didn't work so hot. Well, fuck. Since we already talked about this movie, is there anything else you would like to say? Nope. Really? You have nothing else to add? No, I said I was done with politics, and I am. It looks like I can finally get away from them, since this is the end of the show. I guess you lucked out this time. I don't think we'll have another political episode for another four years. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. Thanks for watching, everyone. Tune in next week for our special holiday episode. See you next week.